What's going on, everybody? It is the Awesome Fan Up Strategy Show. We got a new partnership with Fan Up. If you guys aren't familiar with the app, pretty cool, different way to play daily fantasy sports over there. They have contests that run throughout the playoffs. It's kind of like a combination of best ball, yearly fantasy, and and daily fantasy. A whole lot of a lot of stuff going on. Also, if you're signing up for the first time on the app, use the promo code Awesome. They'll give you twenty bucks for free. Don't have to do anything other than download the app. Sign up using the promo code Awesome. Don't have to put any money down, but you get $20 for free when you sign up using that promo code Awesome. And then also you can enter some of the contests that we have running up there. There's the contest that started last week that has the $200,000 to first place, $400,000 total prize pool. And that's something that runs throughout the playoffs. We'll talk about some of the strategy for that as well. But other than that, Terry and I are going to go position by position, just talking about some of the top overall plays on FanUp for this weekend. Keep in mind, no salary cap. You can play whoever you want. There's the there's the flex position. You get 1.5x the fantasy points. That's going to be important. Cooper Cup, somebody we're probably going to be considering there. But other than that, Terry, how you doing this week? And you ready to go position by position here? Bud, should be uh, good to go through the slate with you and to you know, talk about the different options that we could put in the uh, the different selections. I like to get into a new site. This will be my first time really delving into uh, fan up here. But it looks like a cool app, so I'm uh, interested to talk about it. And uh, yeah, it's been a strange week, but uh, a good one. And uh, yeah, hope, hope same for you. Did you play uh, any basketball on that ridiculous basketball slate last night? I assume you did since you were on the show. Yeah, I did. Actually, it went, it went pretty well for me yesterday, uh, and especially from a prop perspective. I know we had uh, an odd shopper. We had a bunch of Kata Bates job props that looked really good, and he barely ended up playing, so... Right. Those pretty much all hit. So that was where that was the biggest portion of my profit. But also, yeah, yesterday's yep. slate was uh it was pretty pretty solid. And a lot of typically I don't love 13 game NBA slates, but uh yeah, eventually get a normal size NBA slate. But for now, we've got uh some football games to talk about. There's also basketball contests that are up over on fan up uh for right now, focusing on the football one. But let's start with the quarterbacks here, Terry. And obviously at this point in the playoffs. We're basically only looking at elite quarterbacks with Ryan Tannehill and Jimmy Garoppolo being the two outliers here with no salary cap restrictions and us being able to play whoever we want. Quarterback, we're just looking at some of the top guys. So I'm going to ask you, you could choose from anybody this weekend. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers, Joe Burrow, some of the top producing fantasy quarterbacks this year. Who's your favorite this weekend, though? I mean, it's it's really interesting when you can have anyone that you want. You know, we have to play a little bit of that uh, that game of, you know, trying to guess where the public's going to be. We can use our ownership projections from some of the other sites to kind of inform that. And, you know, we want to play the, the, the tap dance of getting a little bit away from the field maybe while still staying with one of the most highly projected guys, one of the most likely guys. When we're looking at a board where Josh Allen is on top by – I'm using our DraftKings projections, by the way. It's very similar scoring, uh, just a little bit of a difference, uh, difference with the, uh, the passing yard totals. I think it's uh, points for 25 yard, point per 25 yards versus point for 20. But same, you know, same overall difference. So by DraftKings projections, we've got Josh Allen on top, and then we've got a five-point separation from him to Matthew Stafford. Joe Burrow, we could throw into that same bucket. Um, any one of those guys I'm really happy to go with, but what I'm trying to judge it by is both our ownership projections and our boom score probabilities from that DraftKings slate. And looking at those numbers, kind of the sweet spot to me is around Tom Brady, where we've got a 7% boom score probability compared to if you go down to like uh, uh, Matthew Stafford and, and the boom score does factor in the pricing from those sites. So it's not perfect for this, but if you go down to like a Matthew Stafford, he's at like half that. If you go up to Josh Allen, he's only a point or two ahead of that. And Tom Brady projected for around 13% ownership on those sites, even though his salary is a lot lower than some of those other guys. So that leads me to believe that Brady's not going to be the most popular pick, and he's right there with the top projected guys. So I'm kind of inclined to go that route, but I don't really think you're going wrong if you pick any one of these guys. I think they're going to be owned somewhat similarly up at the top. There's not that much spread between whether I'm taking Josh Allen or whether I'm taking Aaron Rodgers here. So I'm happy to go with any of them, but just kind of based on the way I was thinking about the slate and how this might come together with where we've got some stronger data points, it kind of led me to thinking about Tom Brady there. Yeah, I think that makes sense if we were going to go contrarian. And certainly the chalk, I think it's going to be pretty split in between Allen and Mahomes in terms of who is going to be the chalk this weekend on FanUp. They're both projected fairly similarly no matter where you look. Something else that does benefit Tom Brady a little bit is, like you said, with it being a point for every 20 passing yards as opposed to 25, 
you know, just think if there's a big passing game, it, it does lend itself to be a little bit more favorable for passing quarterbacks as opposed to rushing quarterbacks, which is something that kind of bridges the gap versus what we see uh, on, on DraftKings scoring, where it's pretty heavily weighted towards running quarterbacks. This makes the two of them a little bit tighter between passing and rushing QBs. So Tom Brady, I do like as a contrarian play. And I think a lot of it matters too. If you're playing the $200,000 to first place contest, $400,000 prize pool that started last week, I think that depending where you are in the standings, that should influence who you're looking at at some of these plays. Because if you're ahead in the standings right now, you could go ahead and play the chalk and just try to keep pace because you're already towards the top of the standings. If you've fallen behind the standings because something went wrong last week for whatever reason, then you start to look a little bit more contrarian. That's where Tom Brady comes into the mix. On this site, though, I don't think we have to consider Ryan Tannehill, Ryan Tannehill or Jimmy Garoppolo at all. Uh, Joe Burrow, Aaron Rodgers, me also still strong options, but we have them projected quite a bit far behind the top QBs. So I'll ask you, if you're looking to play the chalk, do you have a preference between Allen and or Mahomes? That is a real, real toss up for me. I would probably lean into, geez, <laughs> I would probably lean into the Mahomes side of it. Um, okay. Just based on the weapons overall, I, I like his weapons a little bit more in terms of the skill players that he's throwing the ball to in particular. So I would probably go that route, but it's really, really close. I mean, we are really picking nits there. If you look at last week, scoring 41.9 versus 41.06, both very similar boom scores, similar projections for this week. I'm very happy taking either one of those guys. If I gun to my head, I'll take Pat Mahomes. All right, so let's move on over to the running backs then. And I think here's something that's, that's going to be pretty interesting. It's Derrick Henry's coming back. Presumably, I'm assuming that he's going to get a full workload. They've been pretty cautious bringing him back. We haven't seen anything in terms of a definitive report on what his workload is going to be. Here's the most recent report that we have right here is that uh, when asked if he'll be activated for Saturday's divisional game against the Bengals, he smiled. He said, let's see how this week goes. And as of now, the expectation is he's going to start. Any real concerns with you when it comes to Derrick Henry and his workload? Because if he's full go, he's pretty clearly the top running back this weekend. Yeah, and there's also the consideration that like a reduced workload for Derrick Henry is a normal workload for a lot of these other running backs, right? Yep. It's like this is a guy that when he was healthy was getting 27.38 attempts per game. If you look at a guy like, uh, let's just take Jonathan Taylor off the top of the list from running backs for the season, 19.53 attempts per game. So there's just a major difference between his usual volume and how much they feed him the ball when he's healthy. I expect if he's out there, he's full go, and we're not going to need to worry about that. But even if they do reduce it by a little bit, I think he's still probably going to be one of the lead volume uh, volume rushers, and we know he's got the ability. The guy was leading the league in, uh, in running back touchdowns for several weeks after he was injured for the rest of this season still. So, I mean, he's just a beast out there. I'm happy to get to him. The only consideration would be that uh, a lot of the field, I think, is going there. So to your point about like the tournament, if you're in from last week and you're ahead, he's a strong chalk play, I think is probably just a lot of people going to be clicking on it and a, a pretty good bet for the top running back score. But you probably want to go in a different direction if you're trailing and you need to make up points, hope that he fails when a lot of people are on him and then get to, you know, like an Eli Mitchell, maybe, or somebody like that, or an Aaron Jones, maybe, and, uh, and you know, pick up a little bit less ownership and go that route. Yeah, so I think if I'm looking to go contrarian, I would be looking to go Cam Akers. Just from a standpoint of, we don't know what we're getting here from him. He's coming off a torn Achilles, and he looked really good last week. Yeah. Which, here's also something that I tweeted about during the week when it came to Jarek McKinnon, who, by the way, I don't think McKinnon's going to play a big workload this week. We could, for all intents and purposes, for fan up, I think we could ignore the Chiefs running backs. But I think one of the reasons McKinnon looked so good last week was not necessarily because he's some ultra talented running back. He was somebody who had a lot of promise when he was younger, who's dealt with a lot of injuries. But I think just the fact that he didn't play at all in the regular season, and then all of a sudden he pops up in the playoffs as having fresh legs when so many players are banged up, that's a massive advantage at the running back position. And Cam Akers has always been somebody who is really talented at running back. I think he probably would have crushed for fantasy this year had he not torn his Achilles. But he looked pretty explosive last week, and they were willing to give him 17 carries. I think we're going to see him as the lead back for the Rams this weekend. I think the Cam Akers could have a lot of success. There's a lot of volatility there because we didn't really see him play this year. But if I'm looking to go off the board at the running back position, it would be Cam Akers on fan up. Chalk play being Derrick Henry. 
Uh, how do you differentiate between guys like Joe Mixon or Leonard Fournette, who I think that's going to be a very uh, common decision point for people in terms of who they want as their second running back to choose from? Yeah, and those are two guys that I like a lot. I got to a lot of them through the season. Um, I think I would probably lean Mixon just based on the fact that we expect a little bit more running in that game uh, in our game script adjusted uh, data. We've got the uh, Bucks at a 34.1% game script adjusted rush and uh, and the and the Bengals and the Cincinnati's yeah at a uh, 40.4. So a little bit more running expected on the Cincinnati side of things. For perspective uh, on the Titans side, we've got them at 48.9% game script adjusted leading the day. So again, it's just you know kind of that narrative where uh, Henry's going to get fed the ball but I think there could be just a lot of rushing plays in that Cincinnati Tennessee game on both sides I just get the feeling that one's going to turn into a little bit of a slug fest and uh, I think that's going to be a more interesting game than the guys on the last show thought it was I'm kind of looking forward to that one for strange reasons I'm not entirely sure why but just compelling game to me yeah uh I I mean I'm looking forward to a lot of the games this week and something yeah. else also the game sucked so hard last week because almost yeah. all of them were blowouts Every single game this weekend has a spread within seven points. The biggest favorite of the weekend, Green Bay, a six-point favorite over San Francisco. We should, at least based on these numbers, get more competitive games than we got last weekend. So let's move on over to the wide receiver position. I don't care if you're ahead, behind. I don't care. You have to play Cooper Cup this weekend and fan up when there's just no salary cap being considered. If you're going to differentiate, differentiate a quarterback, differentiate a running back. I can't get away from Cooper Cup considering that he never fails. Every single game for Cooper Cup, if you look through his box score, is basically a solid game. Last week was one of his worst fantasy games of the season, and he has 17 fantasy points. There are no actual bad games in Cooper Cup's game log. Play Cooper Cup. Do you see it any differently? No, not at all. I think it comes down to a question of whether you play him in the standard spot or the multiplier spot, and otherwise he's got to be in your lineup 100% of the time. I mean, he's just he's that good. He's that far ahead of all the other options on the board, that much more reliable. So, yeah, no-brainer. Absolutely click him. Whenever you can play anybody that you want, Cooper Cup should be in your lineup. Yeah, and then just to reiterate the way that the flex spot works, which we'll talk about at the end with our favorite flex plays, the overall optimal flex play, it's Cooper Cup by a mile. We haven't projected for the most fantasy points of any skill position player. So the way the flex position works, you're taking a running back, a wide receiver, or a tight end, plug them into the flex spot, whatever their fantasy points are, you get 1.5x, which pretty regularly is going to be somebody like a Cooper Cup. Or in the regular season, maybe there'll be somebody like a Jonathan Taylor that fits into that spot. For all intents and purposes in the playoffs, I think you want to go with Cooper Cup here. As for the other wide receivers, Terry, who are the other guys that you really gravitate towards in spots where you aren't rostering Cooper Cup? Because obviously we have to roster other wide receiver, well, at least one other wide receiver who's not Cooper Cup, potentially two if Cup is in the is in the flex spot. Yeah, so it's a pretty nice luxury to be able to make a lineup that includes uh, Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, and Tyreek Hill if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. That's one way to go. I think a lot of people would just kind of be naturally inclined to pick those three players off the top of the board as they're building lineups uh, this way. So maybe you try and differentiate in uh, game theory a little bit. And if you're going to those guys, I, I certainly don't begrudge it, but it's difficult. You're going to be copying a lot of different lineups. And there are some star studded options that are drawing less ownership projections on our other sites that we can kind of use to compare. So you can get to like Jamar Chase. He's projected for 14% DraftKings ownership, roughly half what these other guys are going off at. You can probably assume that's going to be around the same thing on a site like this. Debo roughly half of the ownership of some of these other guys. Odell, similar story. Mike Evans, similar story. If I'm making that Brady pick at quarterback, I kind of like the idea of using Mike Evans in the multiplier spot and then putting like Cooper Cup and Devontae Adams in the wide receiver spots. You can stay chalky with the you know pr super premium wideouts in the wide receiver spots, play a lesser owned guy in the multiplier spot who correlates with my quarterback. And now we're off and running with a decent lineup build. So that's really the the where the strategy comes in on fan up where you can you know, kind of game theory, some of these, some of these ideas. And I think there are a lot of different options at the wide receiver spot. This is really the spot where you can maybe differentiate with some upside. Uh, like if you can get to a Dell 12 to 15% owned when some of these other guys are 30% owned, I think that's got some value in it. So maybe if it's that oddball lineup where you're not including Cooper cup and you wanted to go Devonte Adams, Tyree kill, maybe you stick Odell in there because it's a direct uh, pivot off of your, uh, your Cooper cup and you're gaining leverage on those Cooper cup plays. So just little things that you can do like that are where some strategy can come into uh, a, a site where you can pick, you know, without salary, you can put whoever you want in your lineup. You still do need to, you know, maybe game through these things. So now I'll ask you, uh, Cooper Cup, we're playing him. 
Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, those are clearly the number two and number three wide receivers on this weekend. If you were to leave either Adams or Hill out of a lineup, which of them would you be more inclined to leave off? Probably Hill. A little bit more volatile to me where Adams is just kind of like the the safety valve and the number one option and everything to uh, Aaron Rodgers up there. Tyreek Hill doesn't necessarily play that role. There's just more options in that offense, uh, be it on the uh, on the wideouts that see some targets or be it the big tight end in uh, Travis Kelsey. So I would probably lean keeping Adams in and uh, give Tyreek the boot if I had to choose. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. And somebody else who people have been gravitating towards that I just kind of think is worth the point of discussion because I've had so much issue with Debo Samuel this year. A wide receiver is not really a wide receiver. I mean, he does a little bit of everything for the San Francisco 49ers, but it's so difficult to project a top wide receiver who just doesn't get targets in the passing game. So I get Debo Samuel finishes with a good fantasy game last week, but he had three targets. He caught three passes for 38 yards. And then he had 10 carries, 72 yards. One of them scores a touchdown. It's really weird that we have a stud wide receiver who's relying on rushing touchdowns to get there from a fantasy standpoint. And I think he's super talented. I just don't totally buy into it. And I feel like I'm saying this all the time. And he's been good, but not great in a lot of these recent weeks. And I just get concerned that you're so reliant on this guy scoring a rushing touchdown. The the game I always uh, harp back to is, I didn't play him in DFS, the game against the Minnesota Vikings. He ended up being the most popular, one of the most popular plays on that slate in week 12. He had one catch for 12 yards, six carries for 66 yards and two touchdowns. So it ended up being an okay fantasy result. But I just look back at those games and say, not sustainable. So how do you view Debo Samuel on a slate like FANA? Yeah, it's kind of through that same lens, right? It's a guy that I think is a better NFL weapon right now than he is a fantasy weapon necessarily. He's capable of putting up massive fantasy scores, but he's got to get there in odd ways. So for our rates based stuff for, for, you know, where we can land some reasonable expectation and have an ability to say, this is what the, this guy projects to do. It becomes a little bit of a difficult scenario and you're playing, they were talking about it on the previous show, right? That San Francisco offense, very much a game manager, kind of a quarterback. We've seen that over the years where these skill players that work with game managers, Manager type quarterbacks don't necessarily get that volume based scoring and they have to come up with different ways to get the ball in the end zone. Debo sees all those bizarre opportunities, but yeah, the volume overall is somewhat limited compared to a lot of these other options. So he's definitely down a few pegs as compared to like a Mike Evans for me, uh, even though they project very similarly and Debo's technically 0.3 ahead if we're going by DraftKings projections. So move on to tight end. Now, once again, reminder to everybody, if you're signing up at FanUp for the first time, use the promo code AWESOMO when you're making your account. Get $20 free in your account. Don't have to make any deposit. No risk to you. Sign up using that promo code AWESOMO. Get $20. And there are some pretty big contests over at FanUp, including their big playoff contest, which had a $400,000 prize pool, $200,000 to first place. So moving on to the tight end position, and it's crazy. We are down to two... Uh, 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 Four games, two in each conference. So only eight teams to choose from and still better tight end options than we have in the majority of regular season full slates this year. Rob Gronkowski, Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, Tyler Higby are all on this slate. Terry, you can only play one of them. Who is it going to be? You're leaving out Dawson Knox and CJ Azoma from that list? Come on. These guys are good too. I know know Dawson Knox caught a couple of touchdowns last week. Leaving him (laughs) off. He's not going to do it again. Yes, yeah, it was CJ. It's uh, those are the oddball targets. Those are your differentiator options, though, too. I mean, I do think tight end is a decent spot to differentiate just because of the touchdown hunting that we tend to do with a lot of it. You do have some target monsters, though, in Gronk, and Kelsey and Kittle here. So those are guys that can soak up some of the offense in the right week. Um, if I'm going to one of them, my favorite at, in a vacuum is Gronk, but I think the, o- the overall ownership is going to be all over Gronk and Kelsey. So if you wanted to differentiate, maybe you go to a, a Kittle or a Higby there and take that, uh, take a little bit of an ownership discount. I think any one of those guys is a strong option. Gronk, like I said, is my top guy for potential scoring. I think he could see a nice uh, amount of targets and uh, a nice amount of volume in the red zone. And I think a lot of this is going to depend on who you play quarterback to. If you're going with Mahomes, yep. I think you want Kelsey as your guy at tight end. We talked about Brady's contrarian option. In that case, I think you certainly want to go with Gronk. Uh, George Kittle is maybe a little bit of the forgotten man here. Here's the concern I have with George Kittle. Uh, The dude loves blocking. And we saw last week a game where he was actually really impactful. A lot of people who are just looking at the fantasy stats, Melo can be like, hey, George Kittle sucked last week. Yeah, one catch for 18 yards and he get done for fantasy, but he was crushing 
in the blocking department, a big reason why the 49ers did have as much success they did in offense in that game. It's kind of hard to rely on him for fantasy, considering that he's been so heavily involved in the blocking as of late, receiving yards over the last handful of games. And this is coming off a stretch where, remember, we had George Kittle, like 181 receiving yards, 151 yards, and and three touchdowns over those games. And then last four games, 21, 29, 10, 18 receiving yards. He's just not getting it done from uh, from a reception and yardage standpoint right now. So I'm more inclined to go with Gronk or Kelsey. So, Terry, we're, we're coming up near the end of our show here, but I think the most important thing to look at is going to be the flex spot. That is the spot on fan up where you roster somebody in the flex spot. It has to be a running back, a wide receiver, a tight end. They get 1.5x their fantasy points. Cooper Cup is clearly the number one option. And neither of us are going to disagree with that. If you're looking to play the chalk, you're going with Cooper Cup. But if you're looking to be a little more contrarian in the flex spot, who is the guy that you're going to take as your a little bit of differentiation play in the 1.5x spot? Yeah, so I think it worked with the uh, quarterback play that I said off the top that I kind of wanted to make, and that's Mike Evans. I mentioned it before when we were talking through the wide receivers. I think you gain a little bit if you correlate your flex play and you make a differentiated flex play like that. He saw 10 targets last week, made nine catches, 117 yards, put one in the end zone. I have no issues going to Mike Evans. He's been a reliable fantasy option for years. I think the same thing works with Gronk if you wanted to put him in that spot instead of Evans, Um, but I just think there's a little bit more uh, advantage to differentiating that tight end in a different way after making these two differentiated plays. So it would be Evans for me. It's going to be Derrick Henry for me. Really wide range of outcomes, but just think about the upside we saw from Derrick Henry in the regular season. He was an absolute fantasy beast. Here were uh, some of his stretch of games before he got hurt. From week two to week six, 50 fantasy points, 22, 28, 34, 38. The upside in Derrick Henry is as high as everybody. People are going to be, I think, afraid to roster him in that 1.5x spot. There's certainly volatility. But if you're hunting for upside and you want to be different, I think Derrick Henry makes sense there. Guys, thank you for sticking around and watching the Fan Up Show. Don't forget, you can sign up using that promo code Osmo. Get 20 bucks for free. Don't have to do anything else but download the app, put in the promo code Osmo, and you sign up. Also, do us a favor on the way out. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Lots more content coming up. Good luck this weekend. Thank you.